Greek New Testament Sentence Diagramming. This is part six of our how-to series. As always, we'll begin with just a little bit of review, not much this time. In part five, we learned two new symbols. First, we learned the series branches. And you see three forms of series branches here. Sometimes you need the common stub on the left end of the branch. Sometimes you need the common stub on the right end of the branch. And sometimes you need common stubs on both ends of the branch. So we have these different forms of the series branches for their respective purposes. We also learned the symbol for the predicate nominative. You see here the predicate nominative at the end of the baseline, completing the verb almost like a direct object. But a predicate nominative is not a direct object. You notice that vertical line that would be present between verb and object is in this case a slanted line that slants back toward the subject. That's because the predicate nominative renames the subject of a linking verb. Certain verbs in the language function as almost an equal sign between subject and predicate. And so the predicate renames or describes the subject. This is very different from a direct object where the direct object receives the action of the verb. So for example, in a sentence, God redeems sinners. Sinners is a direct object. Sinners does not rename or describe God in any way. But in the sentence, Jesus is alive, now the complement of the verb that answers the who or what question after the verb, Jesus is who or what, Jesus is alive, alive is a descriptor of Jesus. And so the predicate nominative needs to be in the same case as the subject, therefore nominative case in a straightforward construction. Sometimes buried down into the grammar of a clause, the predicate noun or adjective may be in a case other than the nominative. But in a straightforward, simple clause, the subject is nominative and therefore the predicate is also nominative. So there's a certain logic to that angled line between the verb and the predicate nominative. Again, that line angles back toward the subject to remind you that the predicate nominative renames or describes the subject. I gave a couple of different approaches to the issue of determining the subject versus predicate nominative. In a sentence containing both an explicit subject and a predicate nominative, obviously both words will be in the nominative case, so you can't determine which is which based on case. Wallace's approach to how to tell which is which is that the big idea is that the subject presents the known information and the predicate is the clause's new information. I have a little different approach to this, which is to say that the subject expresses the clause's topic. After all, that's what a subject is. It's the topic under discussion. And the predicate then expresses the clause's assertion, or if the clause is an interrogative clause, the predicate asks the clause's question about the subject. Both approaches will usually yield the same result, sometimes one a little more clearly than the other. I also presented some mechanical guidance to the question. I'm not going to review that here. If you need to review that, you can go back to part five for that review. We will, though, look briefly at a couple of examples. From the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, we're accustomed to reading. But blessed is not the subject of that sentence. Blessed is the predicate adjective. And we can figure this out either by the basic principle that the subject is the topic under discussion and the predicate is the clause's statement about that topic, or we can take the mechanical approach and notice that the word makarioi, which I've highlighted as the predicate, is unambiguously in the predicate position. That's a matter of grammatical mechanics. The article with the subject and the adjective lacking the article is unambiguously in the predicate position. This is a good example of why I think Wallace's approach to the question of how to determine subject and predicate is not quite adequate. Jesus is starting a brand new topic of discussion here. Neither the poor in spirit nor the idea of blessedness is the known information. He's starting from square one. And so Wallace's guidance doesn't work quite as well here as the guidance of asking which of these is the topic Jesus wants to discuss and which of these is the statement that he wants to make about that topic. Another example we considered was from Matthew 3, 4, referring to John the Baptist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Again, we could take the mechanical approach and notice that the noun trophe has the article. The series of nouns acrides and meli lack the article and therefore are much more likely to be the predicate. Here, Wallace's guidance will work fairly well. There's been no discussion about food, but there has been discussion about John's lifestyle, and food, of course, is one major element of lifestyle. So trophe correlates with the known information that's been under discussion, and the locusts and the wild honey are the new information that's being added in this clause. 
Now we're ready to go on to this video's new content. We have just one topic this time, determining a tributive versus a positive. In part four, we talked about a positives. Just as subjects and predicates are sometimes difficult to differentiate because they're both in the nominative case, the attributive and the positive can sometimes be hard to differentiate because either of these constructions involves a word in the same case as another word and closely connected to that other word. So sometimes it's difficult to tell whether something in a sentence is functioning as an attributive or as an appositive. So let's explore this question. An attributive is an adjective function that expands a noun or other substantive with a simple descriptive word or phrase. That attributive may be an adjective proper or it may be an adjectival pronoun like the demonstrative pronouns, hutas or ekanos, this or that, such and such. The indefinite pronoun, a certain one, is often construed as a simple modifier for a noun. A certain man did this or that, for example. Participles are very often attributive. And sometimes there's just a completely different kind of word or phrase that's in an attributive construction, such as article attributive noun, where the attributive might expand into quite a long phrase between the article and the noun or article noun, article attributive, where again the attributive might be quite a long phrase after a repeated article following the noun. Again, these are adjective functions supplying a simple description of the noun that they modify. The appositive, though, is a noun function that expands another noun or substantive. Well, an adjective expands a noun or another substantive, but an appositive expands the noun or substantive differently. It expands it by renaming it with an alternative designation. The appositive may be a noun, the simplest thing, or it may be an adjective or a participle functioning as a noun, a substantive use of the adjective or participle. It may be another kind of word or phrase functioning as a noun, often bearing an article. The key thing here is that the appositive gives us an alternative way to name the head noun that the appositive renames. By the way, by the nature of the case, the appositive will always follow the word that it renames. An attributive adjective may be placed before or after the word that it modifies. All right, there are some tests that we can apply to try to determine whether something expanding a noun is attributive in nature or appositional in nature. If the word or phrase in question is a noun, then it's an appositive, because in Greek, nouns do not function attributively. In English, we can attach nouns to other nouns as simple modifiers, but Greek doesn't do it that way. So if the word in question is a noun, it's not attributive, it must be an appositive. If the word in question could stand alone in place of the other word, then it's most likely an appositive. If the word in question is an adjective or participle in a standard attributive construction, which I referred to earlier, article attributive noun or article noun, article attributive, then most likely that adjective or participle is in fact attributive. If the word in question is a pronoun, it is most likely attributive. It's hard for me to imagine right offhand a pronoun standing in apposition to some other noun. If the word in question would be awkward if you set it off with a comma, then it's most likely attributive. If putting a comma between the two words awkwardly disrupts the flow of thought, then that word in question must be just a simple description, not an alternative designation. Alternative designations can be set off with commas without making nonsense. Now there is some subtlety as to whether there's a comma or not. There's the issue if you're familiar with uh, some of the details of English grammar between restrictive and non-restrictive elements in a sentence. And so whether you would use a comma or not may be a matter of some subtlety. But if we're talking about significant awkwardness by inserting a comma, then almost certainly you're not dealing with an appositive and what you're dealing with is attributive. Now I should inject here another observation. I'm assuming in all this discussion that you have correctly narrowed your choices to the attributive versus the appositive. Sometimes we miss the boat completely and there's some completely different construction involved. But if we've correctly narrowed our choices to the attributive versus the appositive, this guidance will help us greatly to resolve almost every instance of question. So let's look at some examples. Matthew 2.1 refers to the days of Herod the king. So let's diagram this much in the days of Herod. Now where will we put Tubazileos? Is that a modifier for Herodu or is that an appositive renaming Herodu? Well, Let's start with the mechanical guidance. Is it a noun or is it an adjective? 
Basileos is certainly a noun, and therefore it must be an appositive, because nouns do not modify other nouns attributively in Greek. And we do have the proper case agreement, both nouns in the genitive case. Let me observe, by the way, when it comes to agreement, an attributive construction must agree with the word it modifies in gender, number, and case, and very often in determination as well, presence or absence of the article. An appositive is required to agree with the noun that it renames only in case. Other elements of agreement may very well be present, but case is the only required element of agreement. All right, let's look at another. From the coming wrath, uh, this is John the Baptist preaching that people should flee from the coming wrath. Here we have article, participle, noun, tes, meluses, or geis. That's a standard attributive formulation with the attributive word meluses standing between the article and the noun. So here's the simple prepositional phrase, and meluses would very clearly be diagrammed then as an attributive modifying or geis, not as an appositive. Matthew 3.9 is where John the Baptist is saying that God is able to raise up from these stones children for Abraham. From these stones. Well, here's the basic phrase. Now, it would be very awkward, wouldn't it, to set off two-tone with a comma? From the stones, comma, these. Much, much better to just say from these stones. So certainly this is an attributive, a pronoun, a demonstrative pronoun, functioning as a simple attributive modifier for lithone. Now notice that this is not a standard attributive construction. You have article noun, but then two-tone follows without the repeated article. That's because the demonstrative pronouns do not follow the normal attributive pattern. They will typically be written without an article, where an adjective would require the article. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist is prophesying that Jesus will baptize in the Holy Spirit. So in the Spirit, put a comma in there, in the Spirit, holy. Sounds kind of awkward. Uh, in the spirit, the Holy One. If you add the word one at the end, then it doesn't sound so bad. But really, the simple thing is almost always going to be the best. Don't unnecessarily complicate things. What's wrong with in the Holy Spirit? A nice simple phrase with no complication at all. So this is definitely the best way to take hagio when it occurs again and again and again, of course, in the New Testament with reference to the Holy Spirit. Here's a little longer sentence one that we looked at earlier in another context in this video. This is my son. Let's diagram that much. Subject, verb, predicate. And mu is clearly a modifier for huias, so we'll include that as well. This is my son, the beloved. Okay, that's an adjective. So it could be attributive, but it has an article. So it could be a substantive functioning as a noun that would make it perhaps an appositive. We would set it off with a comma. How does that work? This is my son, the beloved one. Boy, that sounds pretty good. Uh, nothing terrible about that. So this is my beloved son. Yes, very good. This is my son, the beloved one. Hmm, which way should we go with that? Uh, again, I suggest that the simpler is better. Does agape tos really provide an alternative designation rather than just a simple description? If so, then agape tos and huias could either one stand in place of the other. So the voice from heaven comes, this is my son. Okay, fine. This is my beloved one. Oh, boy, if we leave out son, we've really lost something very important there, haven't we? If it just says this is the beloved one, well, this could be an angel. Uh, this could be just some ordinary human being. We really need both of those words. The key word there is son. This is my son. That's the word we can't do without. And then beloved is not just uh, an alternative designation for the son, but a further description of him. Uh, not just a son, but one who is uh, very, very highly valued. So let's diagram that one as attributive. And I think we can do so with a great deal of confidence. Here in Matthew 3.1, John the Baptist arrives. Ha baptistes, what part of speech is that? That's a noun. So just on the face of it, it's got to be in a positive. Can this easily be understood as an alternative designation for John? What does the Baptist mean? A baptistes is a baptizer. So you could say the baptizer arrived. John arrived. John, whose title was the baptizer, arrived. And you could set off baptistes with a comma very easily. John arrived, comma, the baptizer. 
So we have an open and shut case where here we have an appositive. And notice that the appositive this time has to be on the left of the word that it renames because the relationship between John and the verb that he is the subject of cannot be interrupted on that baseline with an appositive injected in the middle of the baseline. So we have to set the appositive off to the left this time as opposed to its being on the right, which is the more ordinary arrangement. Okay, another statement about John. John was having a belt leather around his waist. So here's the main part of the sentence. John is the subject. John was having who or what? John was having a belt. Zonane is the object. Uh, he was having the belt around his waist. Uh, let me, in passing, comment on the placement of that prepositional phrase, around his waist. That really isn't describing the belt. It's not giving us some kind of a characteristic of the belt, that it was an around the waist kind of belt. Uh, it's telling us where he had the belt. So I've diagrammed it as adverbial. You'll do best by default to consider prepositional phrases adverbial and diagram them otherwise only when you really need to, when there's some pretty compelling consideration. Now, what do we do with that word leather? What part of speech is it? It's an adjective. Therefore, it could be a simple attributive. But adjectives can also be substantives, even without an article. John was having a belt, a leather one, around his waist. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? No, it doesn't sound too bad. It's just unnecessarily complicated. Why do we need to say a belt, a leather one? Is dermatinane an alternative designation for zoanane? Could either one stand alone? John was having a leather around his waist. Oh, it really doesn't stand in place of the other one very well, does it? Uh, and again, why complicate things unnecessarily when we can just say John was having a leather belt around his waist? So this is clearly the best construction here. Okay, one more from Matthew 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is Peter's great confession, of course. Let's take the main part of the sentence. You are the Christ. We have subject and predicate questions to wrestle with here, don't we? Who's the topic under discussion, and what's the new information about the topic? Well, Jesus has asked the disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the disciples give all the different answers that people are inclined to give. And then Jesus says, Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up, and he says, You. So this clause is going to make a statement about Jesus. That's the whole context. Jesus is the known information. And the new information, the statement of the clause about Jesus, is going to be ha Christos. You is subject, are is the verb, you are who or what? You are ha Christos, renaming su, and therefore in the nominative case as predicate nominative. So there's your kernel. Then you have an appositive, don't you? You are the Christ, the Son of God. Huios to theou, that's an alternative designation for Christos. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Christos means anointed. So an appositive doesn't have to mean the same thing as the word it renames. Uh, that would be just completely redundant. It usually means something different. But you are the Son of God, Peter could have said. You are the Christ. He could have said either one. By putting the two together, he's giving a fuller statement about who Jesus is, with the second one being an appositive renaming the first. Now, what about those words in blue? The living. You are the Christ, the Son of God, the living one. Would tu zontas be a standalone designation for tu theu? You are the Christ, the Son of the living one. Wow, that's really pretty good, isn't it? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, just a simple attributive. That's pretty good, too. This is one of those instances where uh, really either one does seem to be possible, but it just seems to me that it's a little more natural to take the simpler approach to this and take zontas as an attributive telling what kind of God he is. You are the son of the living God. Okay, we're finished. Happy diagramming.